Welcome to LOA Today. Walt Thiessen and Life Coach Linda Armstrong here. Today is Friday, October the 12th, 2018, 4 p.m. Eastern Time, your second daily dose of happy for the day and last for the work week. Hope your work week's been a good one. I'm sure you are looking forward to the weekend. That's what usually happens on a Friday. That's why they call it TGIF. So a happy TGIF to all of you. And we're going to try to have a really good one here for the uh, second half of today's Daily Dose of Happy because we are going into abstract land. We're going to take on a topic that's so broad and so wide that we don't even know how wide it is. Have we, have we taken a measurement yet, Linda? Do we have some idea of how big this thing is? I'd say mega wide. Mega wide? Okay, yeah. All right, well, that makes sense. It's like double wide, <laughs> only more so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're going to talk about malleability, the malleability of stuff of the universe because we're taught – by initially by quantum physicists and then by uh, mystics and spiritualists who take off on what quantum physicists have to take tell us and take it into realms that quantum physicists hadn't even dreamed of <laughs> and uh, basically look at the very basic question. If what we understand about the quantum nature of the universe is true, that means everything about it is malleable and controllable and moldable and reshapable by thought. Which is quite a challenge because as we go through our day, you know, when I hold a calculator in my hand, uh, I, I can think to myself, I'm going to turn that calculator into a pen and it insists on remaining a calculator. <laughs> <laughs> so, Only because you don't believe you can do it. I guess that's what it is, really. But uh, yeah. it, it, it's quite a concept because, I mean, I guess conceivably, you know, in, in some alternate universe, I guess I can turn that into a pen. If I really yeah. believe it, if I believe it deeply enough, how deeply do you think you have to believe it? I mean, how deep is deep? <laughs> well, uh, you know what? It's pretty damn deep. <laughs> pretty damn deep, yes. Because, <laughs> um, you know, if everything is a mirror and it all comes from these programs within you and, you know, subconscious beliefs and all that stuff, that if you really believed it, why, who's to say it couldn't be? Yeah. It's just because we have this group think about how things are that we decide what's possible and what's not. So we limit ourselves. Well, that's what a belief is, isn't it? A belief is a limit. I mean, anything that, that we believe is, we're, we're placing limits saying, yes, that's what I believe. That's it right yeah. there. I guess it is a limit, even if it's something that you really want. Yeah. Oh, of course. Yeah. Which yeah. I think it helps to explain why it is that as time goes on, we kind of tie ourselves up in knots, metaphorically speaking. Um, like, for instance, uh, we we uh, we often talk about the self the subconscious mind right or the unconscious, and yeah. we attribute certain characteristics to the subconscious mind. But Abraham points out to us that really what's known as the subconscious mind is just simply a collection of all the thoughts that we've thought about and focused on and so forth that we're just really not choosing to think about right now. We really don't want to have to go there if we don't want to, and that's the stuff that trips us up, right? Uh, that it could be yeah. stuff from like you know when we're six years old and all of a sudden it's tripping us up at forty. Oh yeah, because it all, it's all there. It's all it's all in the programming. Unless you delete it, it's there. Exactly. Which which is kind of what you do, isn't it? I mean, you, yeah, you're an energy delete, work person. Yeah, I delete the programs that don't serve you. That's that's why I dig for them and then I you know delete them. So you realize yeah, that that right. almost makes you an IT person because IT people yeah. figure out how to you know effectively erase a disk so that it can never be reread again. That kind of thing. Well, you're you're kind of an energy IT person. Well, and that's cool because I did, you know, I did this recent video about are we living in the matrix? You know, is it all a program? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, who's to say it isn't, right? I just wonder so, what programming okay. language is written in. I guess it's written in energy ease. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, seriously. I actually today on I was on my walk this afternoon. I normally like to get my walks in in the morning, but we've gotten a real uh, splash of cold weather lately, and uh, today was particularly cool. Not, not, you know, snow cool or something like that, but it was cold enough. And so I decided yeah. to go out in the mid afternoon just before the podcast because that would be the warmest part of the day. Well, while I was out there, I was practicing some of my deliberate creation. I was practicing focusing and believing some of my, my big things that I really want to have happen that uh, are not happening as quickly as I'd like them to. And that's what made me think about just how deep is belief? You know, how, how deeply do you have to believe something before you overcome whatever resistance you've got associated with it. I guess there's no real, you know, direct formula, is there? There's no clear formula that says, well, if you have X amount of resistance, you add Y amount of belief, and, and that uh, uh, since Y is greater than X, therefore you get the thing that you're looking for. It's not quite, not quite that simple, is it? 
No, but I, but you know what? But that's why we have a body, and the body is what tunes us into things. So, so what do you, you mean? Can feel it if you can feel it as real or possible. Um, in your, you got it. That's the whole thing with lining up with the vibration. Because if everything's vibrational, then this belief, uh, then this um, desire that you have, that you're contemplating, that you're thinking about, you want to feel how real it feels. So even when you play with it in your mind, it's got to feel real because it already exists, right? Because we can create anything we put our, our minds to. And if we have the thought, it already exists out there, right? We just have to line up with it on the energy. Mm -hmm. So the more you can somehow, even in your imagination, pretend that you are aligned with this enough so that you actually feel it in your body. Like, wow, this is really real. And the cool thing is when you get to that place and and everybody's done it where you can kind of feel something is really going to happen or it feels like it's on the verge, then you get all these little synchronicities, right? Mm -hmm. Which are no accident. It's just the universe letting you know, yeah, you're on track. Yep. You're on track. Yep. You're on track. And that feels good. You feel good. Like you're in a high vibration that allows it to come in. But when those other thoughts come in about how it's taken too long or this isn't going to happen, blah, 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 blah. Um, that's when you hold it away and you could be like right on the edge of it happening. But if you cave to those lower thoughts, those lower vibrations, you're just pulling yourself backwards. It Away sucks. From that it just sucks so much. I mean, the word sucks even applies to that. It just <laughs> sucks, right? <laughs> yeah, but you know what? What is it teaching us? It's teaching us how to be better deliberate creators. This is true. Yes. Yeah. It's kind of like uh, deliberate creating by fire because uh, it's not like you get a manual that comes along with it. We're, we're, we're actually pretty uh, lucky. We've got teachers like Abraham or Napoleon Hill or Neville Goddard or, you know, all these People, Joe depends on all the, all these people who are teaching us how this stuff works. So in that sense, we have an owner's manual that we didn't have, you know, 25 years ago or 35 years ago or whatever. Uh, but yeah. even so with this kind of indirect form of owner's manual, even with that, it's challenging. I mean, l- like I said, I was practicing today. I was actually focusing on my next goal for the podcast, which is a pretty lofty goal. Right now we're averaging a little over 200 listeners per episode. I want 10,000. You know, that, that's a pretty big yeah. leap, right? Um, now, yeah. Abraham teaches us that there it's no more difficult to manifest a castle than it is a button. But from our perspective, castles are quite a bit bigger than buttons. <laughs> They're just like really large and buttons are really small. So we tend to think of them as being more difficult. And that's mm-hmm. really the challenge. I mean, like when I was focusing on trying to attract 10,000 listeners on, on average per episode, that's a pretty big leap. And, and the hardest part is overcoming, you know, the little bits of doubt that are associated with it. I have 10,000 wall. I mean, couldn't you just go for 500? You know, <laughs> yeah. that's the kind of thought that, that creeps its way in. So right. I was, I was applying another Abraham concept, which is passion trumps everything. So even if you're not, you know, if, if you're not uh, attracting perfectly or your, your mind is getting distracted in the wrong direction or whatever, just apply a whole bunch of passion and it'll override it anyway. So I was like, I was like jumping up and down on the, on the walking path. Yeah. 10,000 listeners. It's here. All right. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. I bet you felt really good because you were totally in alignment then. Yeah. For that moment, it was really good. It, it was, it, it's like it blocked out everything else. It's like, there was, but you know, the cool thing about what we might think is overreaching. What's that? That's not overreaching. Cause why isn't that possible? There's no reason why that isn't possible. Oh, no. But at all. when we, when we let ourselves jump to a something that we feel right now in their very moment waking reality feels a bit off. You know what? You reach for that. You get halfway. You're still like overjoyed. Right. And then from that oh, yeah. point, you can decide to go for the, um, you know, the even double that figure. Yeah. It reminds me of the story that Jack Canfield told in the secret. Do you remember that where he told about um, how he ended up selling chicken soup for the soul? He didn't name it by name. It was actually written uh-huh. in the background behind him, but he didn't actually mention the book. But nevertheless, he'd written this book. I think the first Chicken Soup was written somewhere around 1980, 82, something like that. I'm not sure exactly what year it was. But anyway, he tells the story about how he was being mentored by W. Clement Stone, who is also a New Thought um, guru, so to speak, and was very wealthy. He was a multi-billionaire. Um, but Stone had basically asked him one day to set a goal for himself. That was far in excess of anything he thought he could reach. At the right. time, he, I guess he was making about $8,000 a year. So he figured, well, if, if I could make a hundred thousand, that, that's just so far out there. I can't even imagine what that's like. 
So he set a goal for himself to make $100,000 a year, and he had no idea how he was going to do that, not even a clue. So he took a $1 bill, and this is what he does in the movie. You see it. Um, he takes a $1 mm-hmm. bill, and he adds five zeros at the end with a comma and turns it into a $100,000 bill. And then he takes that and tapes it above his bed on the ceiling so that every morning when he wakes up, he sees that $100,000 bill up there. And yeah. you know, he goes to sleep, wakes up the next morning, there's the $100,000 bill. And so he's like programming his mind every time that he wakes up to believe that he's got $100,000. Well, long story short, he um, he ends up uh, with no particular new idea for about a month. And then all of a sudden, he remembers he had this book that he'd written. And he was saying to his wife, you know, if we could sell, and this is based on what royalties were working out to at that time, if we could sell 400,000 copies of that book at 25 cents per copy royalty, that'd be $100,000. You know, I wonder how we can do that. And she said, I have no idea. Well, a few days later, he was at the supermarket and saw the National Enquirer magazine at the checkout. And the way he describes it is that was always just background. But for some reason, this time, it just kind of jumped out at him. And he said, well, you know, if I I bet you if I could get a write up in there, I'll bet you 400,000 people would buy the book. And so he, he was just thinking about that for a while. And then he gave a talk at a local college. And at that, after that talk, one of the people in the audience came up to him and said, that was a great talk. I'd really like to interview you. He says, oh, what do you, who do you write for? And she, she says, well, I'm mostly freelancer, but when I do work for somebody, I usually write for the National Enquirer. <laughs> and, of course, uh-huh. he starts playing the theme from the Twilight Zone. Do, 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 do. <laughs> right. Well, after that happened, the article comes out, the book starts selling like crazy, and at the end of the year... He didn't make $100,000. He made something like $92,375. And the way he says it is, do you think I was depressed? No, hell no. I was amazed. <laughs> right, right. And his wife comes to him and says, well, it worked with 100000 You think it would work with a million? He says, I don't know. I think so. And the next year, his publisher of the Chicken Soup for the Soul series wrote him the first $1 million royalty check he'd ever written. And then, he smi- wow. and then he signed it with a little smiley face at the end. <laughs> now, that's in The Secret. So if you, if you want to see that story told from Jack, it's, it's in the movie The Secret. So I mean, he tells it a little bit better than I do. But that illustrates your point that even if you don't, if, if you come up a little bit short, so what? You did so much better than what you expected. Oh, yeah. Right. Because it's still taking you further from where you are and you're right here, right now. Yes. Thinking. Because, you know, if we keep thinking that this is all there is and this is what I, this is what I've gone. You know, you're just going to stay there, right? Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. And and that's the tendency, we're, isn't it? Because we're always checking. I call it keeping score, right? We, we, we always yeah. keep score to see, okay, has the score changed? No, the score hasn't changed. Okay. Has the score changed? No, the score hasn't changed. Has the score changed? Well, no, the score hasn't changed. <laughs> I, I always like to refer to me, the people I work with, actually all of us as energy artists. So, you know, let's create with this energy. Like we're the artists. We can reach for whatever it is. And sometimes it feels, you know, air, okay, airy fairy. I've got things that I'm reaching for right now that haven't come yet, but I don't let that stop me. I keep reaching for it, knowing I know it's out there. And I don't have all the answers as to how it comes to me, but I'm open to receive. Well, actually we're taught, we're not even supposed to pay attention to how, how is how we trip ourselves up. So the moment that right. I find myself asking a how question, I say, oh, zip that up. You know, just don't even go there. Because all you're yeah, going to do is kill yourself that way. You're, you're just going to drive yourself nuts if you go how. Right. But the thing is, that's why you need to be really good at deciphering what is inspired action and what is forced action. Because nothing happens without anything being done. See, that's, that's a misconception true. a lot of people have about the secret. Yeah, put it out there and it'll come. But, you know, everything is in motion. So if we don't put ourselves into motion, nothing's going to happen, really. Well, it could, but but you're basically I mean, making it, it so much more difficult for yourself. I mean, as difficult as it was to believe in the goal, now you're making it like a million times more difficult because not only do you have to believe in the goal, you have to believe that the goal is going to arrive with you, without you doing anything. You just increase the difficulty right. factor by a, magnif- by a, a magnifying right. factor of a million. It's crazy to do that. Which is which most people can't hold on to. They can't but, hold so that's on to the first wanted- part. <laughs> That's why you want to get really good at deciphering what is inspired action and what is you pushing to try to make something happen. And you can feel the difference. And sometimes you don't catch yourself. And I could say this, I work with energy all the time, but there are times where it takes me, you know, who knows, a couple of days or a week before I actually realize, hold on a second, 
what's the energy behind what I'm doing here right now, what I'm trying to create or whatever that is. And if I stop and look at it, sometimes I'm, I can feel like, oh, hold on. This is kind of heavy. Mm. I don't want that. That's mm. not going to take me anywhere. So you have to flip your vibration. Like I just, I'm releasing a course now um, and it's, it's called High Vibe Living. And in it, I put all my tips up of how to flip yourself to this high, higher vibration because oh. that's how the stuff happens. Mm -hmm. So you want to get kind of good at feeling your energy and noticing it noticing it before it gets too deep because sometimes we don't see it until we're, we get sunk and then we're like whoa i was in a good mood three days ago what the heck happened? yeah right yeah. <laughs> yeah but if you can catch it three days ago like oh my god i'm dipping what's going on okay let me look at it and then decide where you want to take it from there you can always flip it it's a lot easier to when you do it early too because you yeah. haven't built up all that negative momentum to overcome so that yeah. does make a difference but it, take, it takes practice to get used to seeing it mm -hmm. and you know what even even when you're really good at it, there's you know sometimes there's something to learn, right? So something's happening in a certain way, and you're not going to catch it. So you can't beat yourself up. It's like, oh my god, I think no. I've been in this energy for a week. You know, instead of beating yourself up, like, okay, what did I learn from this? What mm -hmm. is it teaching? Teaching me how to be better at number one, monitoring and being that energy artist of my vibration. Um, yeah, and whatever lessons came along in that struggle, because there's always something. By the way, too, we mentioned the idea that you really want to be doing stuff and it's got to be inspired action. You don't want to just kind of sit around and wait because you just make it that much more likely you're going to resist it in some way. But yeah. there's also the fact that we came into this earth to to do the doing in conjunction with the attracting. I mean, because, yeah, because we're creative beings. That, we we that, love to create. For. It's it's like yeah. the story that Esther Hicks tells about how she and Jerry rode the, the river on the river raft. And how what they could have done is they could have gone to the owner of the rafting company and say, instead of just driving us up a river and putting us in the river and then driving down and picking us up at the end, couldn't you just drive down to the end, put us in about 200 yards out, and we'll just do the last 200 yards because I don't really want to have to go through all that contrast. Yeah. And the river raft owner would have said, well, yeah, I can do that, but I thought you wanted to ride the river. Right. And that's the point. We're here to ride yeah. the river. We're here, we're, we're here to enjoy the, the ride, which is hard to remember sometimes, especially when you're in the depths of the contrast. That's about the last time you want to hear about the river. Well, it's, but it's hard to remember when you don't realize you actually have the power to change it. Like exactly. a lot of people don't realize that till they wake. You know, that's what awakening's all about, right? Finding out really your, your true ability to make things happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And even yeah. once you know it, it takes some time to become confident with it. That's what I've spent like the last was it 2007? So 11 years. I spent the last 11 years making myself more confident just by trying, getting it right sometimes, making a mistake, learning from it, you know, all that kind of thing. Just over and over and over again, just learning to master, learning to believe, yeah. learning to keep trying and learning how it all works just by doing it. Yep. So what was the title of this one? Something about malleable? Yeah, the malleability of stuff. What makes, you know, how malleable is the stuff of life? So okay. The stuff being the experiences, right. uh, the people, the uh, uh, activities, the the matter, you know, the the physical items. You know, mm -hmm. how much malleability is there, and and to what degree can we leverage that? You know what? You no, know what popped in my head. I forget that there was this movie where they were uh, something with the name Goats is in the title. You might remember it. Okay. Where, <laughs> um, they're trying to use their telepathy to um, make things happen. It's uh -huh. like this experiment okay. and this guy's really trying really trying but like at the end of the movie um he winds up able to walk through the wall Ooh. because he managed to get that much control over his mind and what is possible wow but not only what the, was this telepathy or being able to make stuff move um he was able to walk through the wall now i don't i don't remember the name but it has the type it has goats in the name <laughs> i don't recognize it all but i'll i'll take your word for it I'll try to find it. Yeah. Goats. I'm not sure what goats would have to do with it, but uh, it's an interesting concept. I, I've often thought about, you know, how far can we go with it? And I think that's what we're all doing. We're kind of experimenting. In in one sense, we are all like, I mean, if there are like uh, 12 years like there are of school, we're in like first grade or maybe second grade. We're, we're, we're learning it, but we haven't necessarily mastered it necessarily. Maybe there are a few people who are in eighth or ninth grade. I don't know anyone who's graduated from high school yet, so to speak. Who, who can just, you know, whatever they want to do, bang, they're doing it. But you know, some, people, some people actually do it without even knowing. 
now they're doing it, <laughs> but they're just holding that vibration. And you know, hats off to those guys. They came in pretty clear. Well, I don't know. That's got to be pretty. That's got to be pretty spooky. You make something happen, you don't even realize that that you did it, and yet you are the one who did. It. Now everyone's asking you, "How'd you do that?" You say, "I don't I know. know. <laughs> it just happens. I just do it." Yeah. You, you mean that doesn't happen to you all the time? <laughs> No. You know, the movie, George Clooney was in it. It's Men Who Stare at Goats. Well, you okay. Enjoy watching that. Men Who yeah. Stare at Goats. I, I first I'll have to overcome watching a movie called Men Who Stare at Goats. But once I can overcome that, it sounds interesting. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're, what, trying to use, they're trying to learn how to use psychic warfare in oh. the, during the Cold War. I think, it's, I think it's based on a true story. Hmm. Interesting. Well, Mind I'll think about it. Yeah, I'm... I, I, I kind of get a little bit. It's got to be really good to have you know a war theme in it for me to to watch it. Like the last movie that I watched that I enjoyed that had a war theme in it was The Imitation Game, the story of Alan Turing during World War II. That one I enjoyed, not because of the war aspect. That that part was really rather revolting. the The part that I loved was how they managed to to solve the problem of the Enigma uh, translation device and 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 being able to break the code so they could you know. Oh yeah, what yeah. They're doing. I I love yeah. that part of it. What is that called? I I saw that. I didn't remember the title. It's called the Imitation Game. They okay. Na- they name it after a an, a sort of a test, a sort of a mental challenge that Turing once wrote about in a paper, in which he proposed the idea of testing to see whether or not an entity is a computer or a human being, and the idea is you if you can create a computer program. That can beat that. You have basically mastered the Turing test. You have created a, a self-aware computer. That's the idea. Oh. Now, did they actually talk about that in the movie? Not at all. Well, they kind of re- alluded to the paper. That was about it. But uh, yeah. yeah, that's what the cool title is all about, the imitation game. But it was great. I mean, well, I don't know. A lot of people know this, but uh, Alan Turing's machine, they called it the bomb, B-O-M-B-E, uh, was how they ended up breaking many of the codes that the Germans used. The Germans actually used a number of different codes. And mm-hmm. that that basic idea combined with a paper that he wrote when he was like 24 years old um, are like the early predecessors of the modern-day computer, which is pretty wow. cool. Yeah. yeah. And one of his – they didn't even mention Gordon Welshman. He was one of his associates um, at Bletchley with the uh, – um, the top secret uh, factory, if you want to call it. It was supposedly a radio factory, but it really wasn't um, during World War II. Gordon Welchman came up with what is the equivalent today of Wi-Fi and of, wow. uh, of, of the Internet, in fact, for that matter. So Welchman and Turing combined to kind of lay the groundwork for what later became computers and the Internet. Right, and which actually started from what? A thought? A thought, Oh yeah, that nobody thought could actually happen, right? <laughs> but then it did. Actually, a lot of thoughts have have gone into it. There were a lot of yeah. predecessor co- thoughts that went into both of those products. Yeah, you're right because everything starts with a thought, right? And, and that actually is the basis for understanding how it is that stuff is malleable and that, that it's absolutely. malleable by thought because it all starts with thought, right? Absolutely. And it actually makes sense when you think about it because if something is originated in thought, then surely the change in it can also be originated in thought. I mean, to say that you can create it, but you can't change it through the same process actually doesn't make any sense. Why do we believe that? You, you can't, I don't know, but nevertheless, that's what we tend to believe. You can create it, but you can't change it is what yeah. people believe? Yeah, people who aren't uh, followers of law of attraction and so forth. Oh, okay. Yeah. You know, once, once a calculator yeah. is a calculator, it's always a calculator, right? You know, that's, right. that's, that's the way people think about it. Uh-huh. Yeah, but it isn't true, not necessarily. No. Um, before we go any further, I want to make sure I get our our promos in. Uh, mm-hmm. Normally, I try to go, do them a little bit earlier in the podcast, but we got going pretty good there, so I just forgot. <laughs> but, okay. uh, yeah, for all of you who are new to the podcast, and if you're not yet a subscriber, please take a moment to become one. Um, we've made it really simple. There are now two links on the homepage of our website at LOAToday.net, one for Android users, one for iPhone and iPad users. And you just click on the one that's appropriate for you, and it, it just walks you through the process. So it, it's really, really easy to s- subscribe now. And then for all of our subscribers, both newbies and for our longtime veterans and everybody in between, please take a moment to share the fact that you're subscribing because it is making a difference. We are reaching more and more people every day. 
And that's actually going to be one of the things, Linda, that's going to make it possible to achieve my dream of 10,000 listeners in a very, very short period of time is having our listeners help do that. So help me achieve the dream, folks. Help, help mm-hmm. me attract it. Because, I mean, when, when you have one person trying to attract it, one person can attract something. But when you have a whole army of people attracting it, it just multiplies the power. I mean, oh, you know, yeah. right? You can tell us all about that. You're an energy expert. Oh, yeah. yeah. When, you know, the energy of a group is really powerful. When thought, when minds come together and put out an energy, it it just magnifies like. Can you yeah. think, can you think of any examples, uh, you know, like a, a real world example, some group that came together, they were trying to, you know, make something happen or manifest X or whatever. Can you tell us a story that might uh, I, might illustrate it? I know that there are actually there's there's a book called I think The Power of Eight. Um, I'd have to look through and see who wrote it. But she talks about, she's talking about how she managed, this was a, uh, what was she, a reporter. And uh, she wanted to find out how things worked with, with um, putting messages out or thoughts out and how it can magnify somehow like this. I don't know. But in that book, she talks about many studies that show how, because a lot of, I guess, Tibetan monks and different groups have put, have done where they would all meditate with a certain theme in mind or something in mind, like um, target New York City and the, its crime rate. Mm-hmm. And so they would meditate and hold this peaceful energy around it. And then the crime rate would lower. So like there are scientific, I, I wish I could recall, I, I can never bring this stuff up because my, my left brain doesn't hold things. My right brain just has concepts. <laughs> you just got to have a little conversation between the two. That's all. Get the left brain on board with the right brain. <laughs> One of these days I'll have to bring my husband in the room and say, can you remind me who did those studies? Because he remember everything. <laughs> Um, but I know that in that book, it was, I, I started listening to it on, I listened to everything on, on audible and, um, she was going over, I mean, she did a lot of these things where she would have people come together online from all different places in the world. And they would have like a picture that represented something that they would all focus on with a certain intention. And then they would calculate how this actually had an effect on that thing. Like maybe it was a glass of water in another room somewhere in the world. And everybody put this. Yeah. I don't even remember how it was, but if you're interested in knowing the science to it, I'm quite sure that book, the power of eight. And while you're talking, I'm going to find that. Yeah, I just found it on Amazon actually by okay. Lynn, Lynn McTaggart. Does that sound right? Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, actually it would be in my phone. Cause I have it on. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the, the description of the book is fairly brief. Um, it's a, the full title is the power of eight. Harnessing the miraculous energies of a small group to heal others, your life, and the world. That's a fairly long title. <laughs> right. Right. So she started taking all these studies that she did on a more of a global scale and tried it because then they want someone wanted her to do some in-person stuff. So she started doing it with the group and she'd have a group of like eight people sitting together and one person needed a certain kind of healing that they were hoping for. And the whole, the eight people would focus on her being healed, whoever it was that they were focused on, whatever the condition was. And like the next day, <laughs> person's healed or they had like some kind of miraculous release regarding whatever that was. She talks about it all in the book. Mm. But so she went from on this global scale to, well, how can we use this? Like, and that's where she came up with this power of eight. She started doing it in groups of eight. It kind of just all evolved for her. Uh, but it, she was not one of someone like me who's just be, very metaphysically inclined to go with all of these concepts. She wanted proof. And I think a lot of people do. I know I do. I've always wanted proof. That's why I kept taking score. If I know how close am I? Oh, it hasn't moved yet. Oh no. <laughs> but, well, then uh, you might, you might enjoy this book then because she does give, um, you know, she'll give you the exact case studies and, you know, where to find them. Yeah. I was just reading the description yeah. and it says, uh, well, I'll just read the whole thing. It's only three paragraphs. In The Power of Eight, Lynn McTaggart, whose work has had an unprecedented impact on the way everyday people think of themselves in the world, reveals her remarkable findings from 10 years of experimenting with small and large groups about how the power of group intention can heal our lives and change the world for the better. When individuals in a group focus their intention together on a single target, a powerful collective dynamic emerges that can heal all long-standing conditions, men fractured relationships, lower violence, and even rekindle life purpose. But the greatest untold truth of all is that group intention has a mirror effect, not only affecting the recipient, but also reflecting back on the senders. 
Drawing on hundreds of case studies, the latest brain research, and dozens of McTaggart's own university studies, the Power of Eight provides solid evidence showing that there is such a thing as a collective consciousness, and now you can learn to use it and unleash the power you hold inside of you to heal your own life with help from this riveting, highly accessible book. Did you, did you know that, that, last, that second paragraph, the greatest untold truth of all is that group intention has a mirror effect, not only affecting the recipient, but also reflecting back on the senders? I would say absolutely, because everything's a mirror. <laughs> okay. <laughs> everything's a mirror. Whatever you're seeing in your existence is somewhere, somehow within you. Even the things that you don't agree with, that, that repulse you, if it's showing up in your reality, it's it's mirroring to you something that's within your own programming. Otherwise, you would never come across it. You would never see it. You would never hear it. So are you telling us that it's all done with smoke and mirrors? Is that what that all adds up to? <laughs> well... It's all part of the program that you're running, the programs that you're running. So, yeah, be- kind of. Be- because those, <laughs> yeah, I, well, I was making a joke, but you turned it into something serious. That, that yeah. the, uh, uh, the, the mirrors are, are based, how'd you say that? that? That it's dependent upon the programs we're running? Yeah. The data that's running in our system, you know, uh, in our energetic system. So you can look at it again like this computer. So if, say, say we're the computer. And there's all this stuff running in the background that, that makes everything work, let's say, within your computer, like this physical thing that I'm actually speaking through to you right now. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of stuff behind the scenes that makes that possible, right? Right. So we, as individuals, have all this data and different programs running in the background, subconscious mind, some of it good, some of it not good. Some of it past experience, some of it that comes through your ancestors, through your lineage, that you're still running, that you've adopted of this kind of a program, be it lack or some kind of illness or who knows what. Um, it's all in there. Well, it, that, the, that's reflective of something that Tom Wells and I were talking about this morning um, because we, we alluded to the idea that we come into this life not knowing anything about you know what's going to go on, and, and we do so deliberately. And the, the joke that I made is, what was I thinking? And and the, that's the, it's actually kind of a half serious question. I mean, what were we thinking to come into life carrying all this stuff from past lifetimes and ancestral stuff and so forth? What what what's that all about? Soul growth. What does that mean? You just want to we, well because we are creators, right? So we're always evolving. We're always growing. We cannot stay still. Nothing ever stays still. I mean, if you have a say, you have a house on the street and nobody lives there, it just decays after a while. There's no energy. Going to it now. Why did I go off onto that tangent? What did you just ask me? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I was oh asking. God, you, I got lost. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to take you down a rabbit trail where you get no. lost. The whole idea was to get to some place we could actually find. But, no, no. But say what you said before, so I can. No, go I was. Back. A, I was asking about what happens. You know, wh- wh- when we come into this life, supposedly, and, and you okay. were kind of reiterating that right. we bring other stuff right. with us, including uh, a blank slate, so that we don't know why we came in. But also, like you were suggesting, we actually bring stuff in from you know an, an ancestral situation. I'm wondering, if this is hard enough as it is, why would we bring that kind of stuff in too? just make the job even harder? Okay, but I was trying to illustrate that even when you think no energy is going towards something, the house starts to dilapidate. Mm-hmm. There's some, it's changing and nothing ever stays still. So you want to feed it energy that makes it prosper and grow and look beautiful. And if you don't feed it, it starts to wilt and deteriorate. No, that's true. Because nothing ever stays the same. It's always changing. Everything's always changing. So we come in here with so much experience because we're not just one timers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're, our energy is very expansive, right? So you come into this lifetime, you wipe this slate, like you don't want to remember all that stuff because there's something you program before you come here. What it is you want to experience in this life, the people you're going to experience it with, the challenges you're going to have so you can evolve and grow into something that you would like to have or be. Okay. But I think we've talked about, I think we've talked about soul planning before. Yeah, we have. And and it's one of those concepts that I still kind of cock my head and say, hmm, really? Okay. Yeah. Then you have, then you have to get the book, Your Soul's Plan. Your Soul's (laughs) Plan. Because that. That that book is a great book. It really illustrates like a lot of the in between time, um, between lives and the planning that goes on before you come into the next one. What's the what's the basic message about 
your soul's plan? What, what's it? What's it trying to tell you? It's illustrating that there's a reason for everything, and that you chose it. So it's part. So there you go again. It's part of the what you programmed into, say, this computer of the this lifetime mm-hmm. uh, to show up in your experience, so that you can evolve and grow. And because all experience is leading you. So even I mean, look at these people who have these like life changing experiences that you're like, oh my god, and then. You talk to them a couple of years later, they're like, that was the best thing that could ever happen to me. Oh, yeah. Because that that didn't happen. I would not blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. Or I wouldn't be able to help all of these people or what, whatever it is. How, I mean, I've had experience too. Where I'm like, wow. Well, even the tear in my rotator cuff as, as a karate instructor, I'm like, well, this isn't good. <laughs> <laughs> but that led me to everything I'm doing now. So it was like perfect for me. But uh, I didn't know it at the time. It, you know, I had to, I had to grow into it. So do you subscribe to the idea that struggle is a normal part of the growth? Uh, I, I say that there's a purpose for it, but I think that we also can c- contribute to making it more than it needs to be by the way we choose to look at it, right? So then you get into the whole thing with what are you projecting where you want to go? Not projecting fears, but projecting, you know, positive, good outcomes. Mm-hmm. So I think things are going to happen. You know, that's kind of a tricky thing because sometimes you're like, okay, well, if, if I already planned this whole thing and I know I've got a pretty good idea what I don't know consciously, but there's an, a plan, then I'll just won't do anything and let it unfold. <laughs> Which <laughs> I think is, that we're, th- that's actually probably the common thing. I mean, even for somebody who doesn't necessarily believe in it, they figure it's like a safe position. Well, I'll just kind of let it do what it's going to do anyway because I, I don't really understand it. So what the heck? Right. But being that we can't help ourselves, we want to create stuff. We can get involved in making it awesome or great or how we want it to be or, you know, and get involved in, in, in steering it into whatever directions might feel like they light us up even more. Or we can just make it go the wrong way because we, you know, we have, we have that free will and we have that ability to make things happen. So that's why we always talk about with law of attraction and everything else, making things go the way that would feel best Mm -hmm. for you and not focusing on what feels really bad (laughs) Mm -hmm. as hard as it is. Cause when things are happening and you're right here, right now reality that do not feel good, it's not always easy to to flip to that higher vibration. And that's probably why I made this course because I've gone through a lot of that over this past year. Like when my sister passed away um, a year ago tomorrow, that hit me like a ton of bricks. Mm. Like what the heck is life all about? Right, right. You know? Yeah. Well, you're right. Those life-changing events, those really major, I hesitate to call them milestones, but those major events in life that throw, throw us for a loop and often make us feel like we're just totally defeated – they often are of the variety that lead to some sort of tremendous growth. Uh, yeah. I suspect in the long run they all do, although there, is some, there seem to be some times where you know, people deal with stuff that is pretty bad and there doesn't seem to be any major growth that comes out of it. I'm not quite sure why that is, but it does. There's... Maybe, they, maybe they don't realize it because like when I think about it, and I'm telling you, there were days where I was like, I, yeah, I just, I mean, I was totally lost. Like I had no answers for anything anymore. Mm. Mm. Everything I thought was one way was all of a sudden upside down. So it took me a while to get past that. But I tell you, I think during this past year, what's happened for me a lot is that I've really kind of honed my connection to spirit and my ability to hear and see more and more. So when I'm, so now I'm, I feel like I'm more effective with my clients and with the work that I do. Having had that experience hmm. and had to work my, my, my way through it. Is there so a- did my sister come here to do that, to help whoever it is that might, you know, like, yeah, I guess so. Is, yeah. is, if I go back to the original topic, the original topic being the malleability of stuff. If we look at, say, your sister's death and, and what you, ha- what you went through afterward, the, you know, the trials and tribulations you went through afterward as a test case, does that test case in some way reinforce the idea that stuff is malleable? Yeah, absolutely. How so? Well, I don't know. I could have stayed in that low depressed state where nothing makes sense and life sucks and, you know, it's unfair and all that. I didn't, I didn't stay there. I changed that energy. I flipped it around to 
to look at, I guess I took the, I tried to take a perspective from her soul's point of view. And I saw that definitely she, she helped a lot of people, at least in my family, really open up to maybe more of this connection to spirit and their own power in some ways. Mm. Um, because which, as a result of her passing, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. And I had already been, you know, people have been, I, you know, that was already kind of unfolding. In fact, I, I had my sister open up to that whole thing all while she was going through her cancer stuff. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I guess we, mm-hmm. we got a little close to home there, so I don't want to push too hard. But the, No, no, that's okay. I'm just trying to put it into words, this, um, yeah, but anyway. <laughs> That's all right. I, it's hard to describe. Yeah. Well, I guess that's what, what always is the case, especially when it's something that is really that important to us. Sometimes it is hard to put it into words. Um, yeah. So maybe I try to find for, you know, try to reach a different example, but I'm, I'm not coming up with one quickly, but just any kind of situation where uh, it just seems like there was nothing you could have done. It worked out the way it did. Sometimes it feels, it, there's a powerlessness that we sometimes feel. Uh, that especially if those of us who are early deliberate creators and we understand the idea that we do have the ability to create and yet we have our own feeble attempts that don't work out and those are the times when it actually feels like it's even less likely that we could actually change the nature of something, that we could change you know, the way it's constructed or the way you know, the life is around it or, or whatever. That, you know that's, what, that's what it's hardest. What that's bringing to mind, especially with this situation with my sister, is that the whole time she went, she had cancer twice. So the whole time she went through it, she never looked like a cancer victim. And it always looked like she was totally going to beat this thing. Hmm. But then um, when it happened where all of a sudden now she's passing away, it was happened like in a nine day period. Hmm. So I know because my sister the whole time never wanted anyone to pity her. Hmm. She didn't even want people to like be falling all over her trying to help her. She was very strong through the whole thing. She's like, I got this. And I think for her, and I even connected with a few psychic friends of mine, she needed to have it happen that fast, that quick, so that she didn't have this huge family of ours pitying her or feeling miserable for her. Like it happened so fast Mm. that it was kind of like here and then done which I think had to be her way because she the whole entire time never wanted people to be like crying over her. Mm. Yeah. So that tells me she totally, I know she planned it to be that way. You think she she planned that consciously? No, not consciously. Not consciously. On a soul level. Uh, soul she level. planned it that way. It had to be that way because she was, she really didn't give up mm-hmm. even till the day, even till when she died. She, she really didn't give up consciously, but on a soul level, cause I connected to her on the soul level. I knew she was leaving, um, that day. Um, yeah, very, very interesting. So that's why we get back to like, if we have this plan and this is how it's going to be, but still you, you have some kind of control over that. So really what she was teaching people was how to, no matter what's going on, continue on, you know, live your life. Not in this energy of I'm dying, you know, who knows, next week, the next week after, next month, two years from now. You know what I mean? It wasn't there. It was like, I'm living my life. Um, so I think she taught other people that kind of thing too, like, you know, making the best out of it. Which is actually a, a really good philosophy. I mean, take, yeah. a, take a law of attraction out of it. Take, you know, source energy out of it. It's still a good philosophy. I mean, I, I like the idea of, you know, I just keep going and going and doing and doing and living and living. And then all of a sudden, boom, it's done. Yeah. Yeah. And actually what, I, what I'm thinking now too, as I think about it, um, she always was create, even like a month before she had everybody. And she did like, we didn't, you look at things after the fact, like, did she know she was going to pass? Cause we, she made everybody like, she, we were going to do this pumpkin picking thing. And you know, my son's 27, but there were younger nieces and nephews. She's like, you have to go and you have to bring steel. I'm like, all right. Like, I really didn't want to go. <laughs> and even that day, I almost backed out. But some, for some reason, my son was like, no, let's go and do it. I'm like, all right. I was there. And she's like, aren't you glad you're here now? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, if it wasn't for you pushing me, I would have never been here. <laughs> I didn't know she was going to pass away a month later. Mm. But somehow that happened 
And she brought this energy to it of this fun experience for everyone. Not like we need a fun experience because I'm dying next month. She didn't know. I was like, <laughs> consciously, she didn't know. Right. But she made it happen because I wasn't going. Well, yeah. then let me ask you something else since we're on a on the rather d- difficult, challenging topic of, of death and passing and dealing with it as a survivor. Um, what do you think? Do you think that everybody who dies actually choose chooses when they're going to die? Because that's, not, that's a key idea that Abraham gives us, that it doesn't happen by accident. We all decide we're going to die. Yep. Well, that was pretty clean <laughs> yeah. and straightforward. You just, right. There was no That's discussion right. on that one. <laughs> yep. But you know what? I think we have these windows of opportunity. Like, I guess she could have checked out. I'm, cause I'm only going to talk about her because that's all I can talk about. Mm-hmm. I guess she could have checked out the first time she can go around. But you know what? Her kids were still young. So she probably made this sole c- decision that, no, I'm sorry. This is not, I'm not taking this window of opportunity. You can send me another one when they're older. Mm. Okay, well, you know, her daughter was 19 and her, her, her son 20, uh, 20, 24. What is he? 23. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it was, and it, you know, it, it is as hard as it is. It's easier for them now than if they were, you know, five years younger, eight years younger with the first time that came around. Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Lu- Louise could actually identify with that because her mom passed when she was, I think, 21 and she had, uh, two strokes. The, f- the first one was six years earlier when Louise was 15. And that would have been harder for her, I'm sure. I mean, right. th- she, right. actually, so, she got the last so, couple of years with her, her mom because she ended up being kind of her mom's caregiver and, and like the, the woman of the house because her mom couldn't be that. And it, yeah. it, it, it placed a lot of stress on Louise, but it also gave her time with her mom to really get to know her mom before her mom passed. And that was invaluable right. to her. And so it could be that there was this opportunity to go now and her mom's like, no, my, I'm sorry, my daughter's still too young mm-hmm. and went at another point. I've had, I have had some psych, psychics tell me things like that or explain when, a, when I went to see an event or something, explain things like that. Like there are different windows, windows of opportunity. So on a soul level, you're choosing like, because you still have, I mean, you have free will and you call the shots, right? <laughs> Yeah, apparently that, and that's what we're driving at here with, with the whole topic that we ha- we call the shots not only about our life, but what we're going to create in the life and that all of it is malleable and that all of it is changeable. Um, yeah. I, I, I really have a great deal of difficulty believing that this calculator can turn into a pencil. So I don't really expect it to turn into a pencil anytime soon. It's and not be- even, it's not important to you though, is it? It's really not. That's the other thing I was going to say. There, there's, I have no value in turning it into a pencil. It'd be like a neat trick, but that's about it. It's not like right. I'd be so psyched. Oh wow. I turned a calculator into a pencil. Hey everybody, look what I did. You're like, oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, that's, that's how much, you know, importance I attach to it. So I probably don't really care too much about that, but the stuff that I do care about, that's the stuff I do want to change. And I think this is where the trap happens. We tend to look at the calculator and treat that as the test case to measure against whether we can manifest the 10,000 listeners or whatever it is. Well, you know what? I'll tell you something I don't have direct experience about, but you know, one of the modalities I work with is called Theta Healing, mm-hmm. Theta, T-H-E-T-A. Okay. And there's a course that Theta Healing teaches. It's called DNA3. I haven't taken that course, although I've taken many of them. And in that course, there is an exercise. It's all about working beyond our normal parameters, right? And I know that there's a um a part of the course where you have a glass of water and you project a flavor into that water, just regular water. And then the person you're working with, you know, will then taste the water and see if it has the flavor in it. <laughs> <laughs> and and they do this. Create the flavor into the water. It's just regular water out of the tap. Mm -hmm. So that's working beyond what you would think were the normal parameters. I mean, that's really changing the calculator into a pencil in some ways. In some ways it is, yeah. It's what what they're working on in the course, and everybody's in agreement that, wow, this is really cool, and can we do this? We can do this. So there's already built within it a belief system that it can happen because it has happened, (laughs) Right. And, and I suppose that's a good example of when uh, a group effort really helps. Because yeah. if, if you have a bunch of people who have varying degrees of belief in it, when they combine their efforts together, they're going to multiply them. 
And then right. it's, it's going to become stronger. So there, there, I guess that's a good reason for doing things as a group. Yeah. Yeah. See how it all ties together? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does tie together. And that's part because, of the fun of doing these shows, actually. It's, right. It's learning all the ways we kind of went off on little different roads, but it's all coming back to the same thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. like Abraham says. You, we, we will answer all of your questions just as long as you understand that it's always the same answer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> a little disconcerting the first time you hear it, but uh, after you hear it a few times, it's, it starts to make sense. It starts to, to seem like, you know, this stuff really is malleable. And I, I actually do now begin to look at the calculator a little bit differently or anything else. Now, I, I, I am not yet to the point where I necessarily believe that I can change it. But I'm now more open to it because I've had some experiences that show that I can manifest stuff. And some of them are pretty, pretty powerful and kind of shocked the heck out of me. So yeah. I know, I, I know I have some evidence to work with there that kind of reinforces it. And I kind of get the sense over time, I am attuning myself to the possibility that stuff is as malleable as we like to make a joke about it, that it really is that malleable. It's, I, I think the belief is building. Yeah. Which well, I, I mean, I would think you'd have to do that too. I mean, cause you're an energy healer, right? So anytime that you're working with uh, a client and you're trying to help them on an energetic level, it's one more opportunity for you to, in a sense, apply your belief to, to see how strong it is and just to just, you know, go for it, so to speak. And, and, it, and you probably build it up in the process, I would think. Uh, you know, whatever somebody is coming to me for, I'm, or I'm, I'm the one who's going to be holding that container for them of the possibility of how this can be mm-hmm. so that they can walk into it. Mm-hmm. So it's already setting the stage for that energy for it to unfold. And so we just clear whatever comes up in the way that could be in the way. But I'm saying, doesn't that also each, doesn't each experience reinforce your own belief level? Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the th- things that th- something will, yeah, because like I'll be in a session and something will pop in my mind that, that I'm kind of being guided to ask them about this. And I'm like, in my mind, I'm thinking, no, I can't ask them about that. That's, that sounds just too crazy. But I've, I trust it now to where I'm like, okay, I'm just going to go with whatever comes in. And it always means something to that person or takes them to whatever it is that needs some clearing or, you know, some resolution around. So. Yeah, that kind of stuff happens all the time. That's why I'm really open <laughs> to. Does it ever surprise like you anymore? When I'm you're probably doing a way too gullible. I'll believe You're anything. too gullible. <laughs> <laughs> At this point. Does, does yeah. any of the stuff that happened in a session ever really shock you? Like, oh my God, I can't believe that happened. Uh, well, it, it, it shocks me how the things that will come through actually mean something. Cause you're thinking, well, this is, this has nothing to do with anything I'm doing here right now, but it popped in. So I guess I have to say it because that's what spirit's given me say it and it's like it's like the 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 piece of the puzzle that was missing that takes me right where they need to go Hmm. so does that answer that question (laughs) well kind of i mean you didn't really indicate how how it affected you you just you you identified something that is kind of wondrous um but i Hmm. i guess i'm asking it it, i think it's got to be affecting you it's got to be affecting your belief system in a pretty big way every time something like that happens well it just reinforces that i what i believe Really? I mean, I believe anything's possible and I believe we have this connection to spirit and that we're not just the energy of this physical body, that we're far more expanded than that. So when I can tap into something that feels like it's outside of me and this kind of answer comes in, then, um, yeah, then it's like, wow, okay. There's some, (laughs) there's lots of support out there for all of us. So if we can, if I can help people to be able to tap into that stuff for themselves, that just empowers them so much more. And, and you know, that, that makes me high. So like when I do my work, I, I sometimes don't even remember everything that's being said because I'm such in this high vibration energy. So I don't know. To answer your question is probably, yeah, just, it just reinforces more and more to me about how just about anything is possible. You sound like Wendy Dillard, who um, will, will tell a story about some you know, transformation that she's achieved in her own life or something that she helped the client to achieve or whatever. And uh, particularly if it's a, a situation where she made some sort of major shift in her own life with some very positive result, uh, you know, learning something more about uh, you know, being in contact with her inner being or something new manifested that was really cool or something like that. I'll ask her, so, so how did it feel? How did it feel when you had that new thing happen? And she'll reply... 
normal. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. And that's what it sounds like you're saying. Well, it's it's yeah. normal. <laughs> it's because, almost anticlimactic, but <laughs> well, because the more that you invite the possibilities in, and they and they show up, even in ways that you never kind of thought were possible, it it becomes kind of normal, which is great because then it allows it to happen more and more and more. What do you mean? Meaning that we're attracting more and more normal, stuff, more and more opportunities to do the same thing. Is that what you mean? Yeah, because if it's normal, that means you're 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 vibrating, you're in resonance with this type of thing happening. So more and more of it's going to come. That's why it would feel normal. It wouldn't feel like out there, like oh my god, how the hell did that ever happen? It's like oh, you know, well that happened because I was, you know, we were working on the energy and blah blah blah. It was just part of the daily experience. One more day of just yeah. manipulating energy. Wasn't that fun? <laughs> or, or even just knowing that as you hold that higher vibration and as you get more into that kind of surrender to allow all the good that wants to come to you to come in. Um, actually, what, what's good about that is it makes you be able to hold that surrender space even more. That's a hard space to stay in. So each, what you're saying is each successive experience where you get some sort of new opportunity to see a wonder or hear a wonder or, or experience something happen that you didn't quite expect or whatever is one mm -hmm. more opportunity to how make it more to, normal, to make it more normal, to, to let go of the resistance. Is that what you're trying to tell me? Yeah. To see that, Oh, this is, this is real. Actually, why don't we put it that way? This is real. It's real. It's become real. This is real. These things come into my head and it means something to somebody. Okay. I guess there's a purpose for mm -hmm. it. You know, okay. that it's, hap it's happening because it's happened more than once. You know, so, so then you're open for it to happen even more, right? So now you're in alignment and in resonance with receiving. That's why it's really good for people to notice. I like, in fact, I did a meditation group this morning and uh, one girl re pulled a card and something to do with uh, angel numbers. And, and she goes, well, I don't know. I don't pay attention. I'm like, well, let's just start paying attention. <laughs> and then as we're talking about this, she's like, oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's right. That these kind of things do. I'm like, yeah. Pay attention because when you realize that numbers mean things, certain animals come across your path or some kind of experience that hits you in a certain way, look it up online. Metaphysical or spiritual meaning around a uh, bluebird flying into my window. I don't know, whatever it is. <laughs> you'll, somebody's written about it and they'll, and they'll, you'll be, too, it'll give you a message in some way. So you'll be then in, in a lot of times your answers will come in these kind of abstract ways. If you only pay attention, because spirit can only manipulate so much in the physical world, right? So they're they're trying to guide you, guides and you know angels, guides, God, whoever, um, to note it. You know they'll, they'll they're trying to give you this helping hand, right? If so, if you're asking, you know, show me how to uh, double my income, blah blah, whatever. Then you got to be open to see the signs that come your way. Now, a lot of people don't pay attention. Your numbers are really big. You can get a lot of guidance from that. And it really lifts you up and helps you to stay in that higher vibration. Or like, you know, an eagle comes past my, I'm um, over my car or, or in my backyard. I'm like, wow. Oh, that's a beautiful message. Thank mm. you. You know, and then if I forgot what the message was, I'll look it up and it'll be like right on key. Just the thing I need to hear or see, you know? So you think there's so, a universality of messages, like uh, symbols always mean the same thing rather than being more individualistic to the particular person. Well, the particular person is going to take it however it resonates for them. Two people might not take the same message as the same thing. Oh, okay. So there is an individuation yeah. that goes on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, like maybe, maybe you're going to do your Google search and the things that are going to come up for you or the ones that you click on because energy is energy. You might be drawn to the ones that are going to give you they're basically all going to say close to the same thing, but you might have different people's twists on it. You know, the different psychics who experienced whatever that was. And this was the message that came through. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. okay. you'll, you'll hit like a million different blogs that might be talking about the significance of an Eagle flying over my home or whatever, you know? Well, our listeners now have their homework cut out for them because unfortunately we're out of time, but this has been great. And uh, I hope you have a great weekend and I look forward to continuing the conversation next week. Yeah, absolutely. You too. And we'll be seeing you all next time as well here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.